my name is Theodos Veropoulos, and I have the pleasure to basically introduce a colleague for over two decades uh, to a place which he knows very well, and the place knows him very well. Um, tonight's lecture is by Patrick Schumacher. Um, for many, a kind of uh, agent provocateur of contemporary architectural uh, practice and theory. Uh, Patrick has been, I think, in many ways, and in, I guess from my perspective, from a very personal one, somebody that has always been very uh, open and unapologetic about the role that design plays in the way that we think and in the way that we action, what we mean by design in the world. And he has had, I think, the benefits of at the same time being very much engaged in education in places like here and the Angavante, Harvard and uh, Columbia, uh, to in parallel work in a practice like Zaha Hadid Architects, which I guess from my own experience, seeing many of our graduates go and work there, uh, has really evolved as the conversation has evolved in terms of the role that computation and new technologies are playing and how one somehow really deeply engages in maybe you know, the project of architecture. Uh, Patrick uses very specific language, and that language is, in some sense, very much a kind of almost manifesto-like attempt uh, to speak through, I think, a lot of the projects, but also his own background in philosophy and theory. And I think that kind of conversational apparatus is something that I witness, I think, almost on a weekly basis. And I think that the nature of that has always come with a great generosity from his part uh, for students, for people uh, to basically be galvanized around, uh, you know, the discourse of architecture. And I think that that's actually probably more meaningful now than it has uh, been in a long time because one could speak to the fact that there are not many people that are engaged in what we would consider practice and at the same time trying to write about this and try to theorize it and try to see the implications of what that actually means, not only for an office, which obviously many people in this room have had some affiliation with, but also in the spirit of what design research is, what community means, and to be honest with you, uh, what difference means. I mean, in my conversations with Patrick, I think I could be rest assured to say that we've celebrated differences over the years and that respect to have a conversation around the subject of architecture is something that necessitates that. In 2008, I was in Venice when Patrick uh, spoke to parametricism as being the possibilities of a new style or a conversation around style again to somehow pick up the conversation about where postmodernity had left off. All of these kind of well, how he interprets research moments and movements and how that could be potentially synthesized again in a different way. And that difference, I think, in a meaningful way was around accelerated communication technologies, computation, and really how that was somehow opening up the possibilities for a very different conversation. Since 2008, and I remember Dark Side Club conversations, provocations at Venice, continued kind of books in this room in 2010 when he published Autopoiesis of Architecture. In the spirit of that, I think it was an opportunity to see his work and the work that he uh, had been developing for many years with Zaha in a conversational kind of platform to use it almost as a foundation for a certain kind of discussion that maybe was missing. At that time, you had Zaha, you had Wolf Pricks, you had Brett Steele, you had Alejandro Zeropolo. Some people read the book. Some people just looked to see if their name was in the book. The reality of the way that people were somehow engaging the actual publication itself was interesting because in many ways, even if it was using the publication as an opportunity to discuss things, it served a purpose. And that purpose is becoming uh, potentially less and less obvious and in the spirit of this room, to be honest with you, where we could always speak about architecture in many different ways and agreement wasn't somehow necessary, 
I think it's important to see what the value is of the different projects and the different authors of how uh, they see practice today. Now, his, his background, particularly in philosophy, influences a lot of the things that he talks about. Uh, Nicholas Luhmann is somebody who, in some sense, wanted to categorize everything in society. So when you see that as a kind of seed, I think that that sets up a particular conversation or a desire to basically see from a systemic point of view how all aspects of society could somehow be understood through this kind of unifying treatise. The necessity of that being a unified treatise today is something that's an open question. And I'm sure that that's something that Patrick himself would be probably very open uh, to have those debates. Uh, from my side, uh, as a colleague, which I think I've had the pleasure of debating him for 20 years, and that has served to influence some of my thinking. Uh, as somebody who I've seen the office grow from like 25 people, I don't know if it's 500 now or whatever it is, uh, that kind of culture of design and the belief that design has a meaningful role, I think, is very important. And so I think for tonight, I think it's a conversation about a book that continues that, I think, personal search for Patrick to basically come to terms with philosophy and practice. What I appreciate about the book is that it foregrounds architecture with a big A, meaning buildings, which I think is an important part of how we see our contributions to society at large through the development of buildings, development of cities, and in some sense, taking a litmus test of how technologies are impacting our life. So with that, I'm going to bring my little introduction to a close. I warmly would like to welcome Patrick to the AA and to continue the conversation that hasn't been left off in 2010, but. I think that that was the major kind of conversational moment when he put his theory to practice. And I think this book continues from practice now back to conversation in this space. So with that, please welcome Patrick. Thank you, Theo. That was a very nice introduction. And yeah, I'd love to be here. Thanks for everybody for coming and checking out this new book. It's been a while I was lecturing here. <laughs> so it's nice to be back. And yeah, some of the, I'm also very happy that some of the, and quite a few of the protagonists of tectonism are not only sitting in this room, but are emerged through the AA. So they have been a major hotbed of not only parametricism, but also the latest stage tectonism. And that continues in certain pockets. It's not as pervasive as it used to be. But there's a critical mass of research and ongoing work and pushing into the reality of the built environment not worthwhile noticing. So yeah, Tectonism is kind of a nicely packaged book. It's, it's nearly like an extract of volume three of the Autopus of Architecture I've been working on and focusing on the current most sophisticated style and paradigm of architecture which we all should be working in, I believe. And, but it's a tough one. It's a hard one. It has a certain level of sophistication requiring a lot of skills and knowledge and a lot of collaborative integration with expert teams. That's why even Zadid Architects is not necessarily, with all our projects, we're not necessarily at the forefront of this particular uh, agenda yet. So yeah, this is the sequence of the books I have published. And it's quite interesting that I still 100% subscribe to the thesis of all of them. And the first one is probably little unknown, Digital Hadiths, worthwhile looking at, and also in terms of the, the project at the time, which we were doing. Um, <clears throat> so start with a definition. So tectonism is the most advanced stage of parametricism and implies the expressive heightening of engineering and fabrication-based form finding and optimization processes. So it's not a substitution for parametricism. So parametricism is the overarching umbrella. And expressive heightening, what does that mean and for what purpose? I mean, a lot of us are intuitively interested in new expressive possibilities of architecture. But I'm saying with the objective to increase information richness and legibility of the built environment, 
And that is a primary aspect of social functionality. That's my thesis, which I'm adding, let's say, to the reality of tectonism, which is an ongoing reality for, I would argue, for at least 15 years in, with the movement of parametrism shifting to become tectonism. And you can see here the expressive richness, the new set of repertoires which are coming on, on and we probably wouldn't have been able to just invent, but they're coming out of novel <coughs> structural engineering logics, because structural engineering went to major transformations through its computational empowerment and optimization process, so it's a very different type of structural engineering. And only parametrism slash tectonism is congenial with that and able to pick that up, and that drives a lot off in terms of global form, but also in terms of detail articulation. <clears throat> but also we're talking about, we'll talk about environment, environmental engineering logics and particular fabrication logic because there's a whole new world of fabrication which this movement of primatism went into and invested heavily in. So that brings forth this fantastic repertoire uh, of many different families of internally coherent but highly versatile um, articulatory repertoires, as I call it. So, so, yeah, I mean, it matured in the last 15 years. Five years ago, I had started to write an article about it first. And I would argue its visual appearance is unmistakably distinct, but a distinct version also unmistakably of parametricism. They're delivering a massive increase in architectures of expressive versatility and potency. And that is really significant for the way architecture functions in the built environment for society, and that's not often sufficiently appreciated. But also, I want to step back, I mean, the scope of tectonism and parametricism is universal, I mean, and that needs to be understood. I mean, I've been recently called a megalomaniac here in this room, very recently, but I'm just formulating the ambitions naturally a discipline like architecture, an academic discipline like architecture, a global architectural discipline and discourse, should have. It has universal scope with respect to, uh, yeah, it encompasses the whole of the built environment and the world of artifacts. That is the totality of the human phenomenal world, physical and virtual now as well, for the 21st century civilization. So the only exceptions are basically the residual raw nature that plays no role in structuring social interactions. So everything you touch, see, uh, engage with, uh, meet people within uh, and through is our domain. And our competency with respect to that um, is exclusive in the following sense. So architecture and the design discipline from urban design and landscape design to interior product fashion, as well as graphic web interface and interface design, hold exclusive sway over the perceptual world conceived as user experience, if you like. That is, all production decision, decisions with regard to the perceptual and interactual aspects of this man-made world, only accepting the residual vernacular environments at the margins of world society, are channeled through the needle's eye of our global design discourse. So all of that is professionally designed, everything you touch, including fashion, <laughs> by colleagues, and they all, as professionally trained and engaged in publishing designers, are in, we share a global discourse. And that's where, where we impact. That's where we can impact on the physiognomy of the planet, basically. And that's what we need to be aware of. And that has been like this roughly for 100 years. It started with the Bauhaus. This ambition was very clear across all design disciplines and then rolling out uh, across the 20th century a totally new physiognomy of the planet, uh, uh, space so interaction. So, and I think it's important that this impactfulness can only happen if there is some sense of discursive convergence, that the discourse is there to collectively, critically, find the, the path forward where we can kind of collectively channel our energies. So the discourse is currently fragmented. The new book calls for discourse intent on convergence and speculates on the prospect of a convergence around the further development of parametrism, tectonism. And I'm just quoting the last sentence of the book. 
uh, to allow 21st century architecture to finally have, once more, a vital, decisive, transformative impact on the built environment, the way modernism had done in the 20th century, namely to deliver a total remake of our planet's urban physiognomy. That's the ambition, and it should be our ambition. If it's my personal ambition, I mean, forget that. <laughs> it's not going to reach very far. But I'm just showing this as an example. So it, I was talking about excluding the kind of vernacular margins, but everybody can be involved. Of course, in some kind of uh, marginal communities, you need NGOs and charities to become the client to bring something of the contemporary architectural culture also to these communities. <clears throat> okay, so just another slide of what this looks and feels like. And you can see it's quite distinctive from the earlier Pamadison which was primarily, and you'll see NURB surface modeling, etc., all in white or gray. And here you have very distinct types of geometry coming <clears throat> out of distinct structural logics and fabrication and genders. Okay, but Theo hinted at this, this concept of style and my theory of styles in the plural is very important, I think, to realize that we own this concept and not cast it aside because it has doing incredibly important discursive work. So first of all, the thesis, there can be no rational design process without an underlying explicit or implicit style. So if you design, you have certain principles by which you go about it, how you start looking at the brief, for instance, how you, what, what geometries you have at your fingertips, which tools you use, which arguments and phrases you use to kind of weed out and push forward the project. So there is something, and you're not going to change from halfway through the project or from one project to another into totally different sets of values, principles, etc. So there is an underlying style. And if that is shared, then this just becomes heightened to become a kind of potentially epochal style. So that's very, very important. And we need to recognize that the history of architecture and the writing of books trying to summarize the style of the era have been, and the projecting new possibilities for the next stage of societal environment have been very, very important in shaping the built environment, also the shaping of this course. So I, I mean, and these are all very influential for me. In particular, I start with 1932. It's Hitchcock and uh, Johnson, Philip Johnson, the international style coming out in 1933, the MoMA show in 1932. Uh, and this was, you know, over a decade after modernism has emerged through the Bauhaus uh, with Lecobie, et cetera. So these kind of late summaries and canonizations and condensing principles. And then there's a few others I'm mentioning here. I think we can also mention Charles Jenks' uh, language of postmodern architecture. Then for me personally, so I got very much interested in that as well, as well as in uh, deconstructivist architecture. There's Philip Johnson again, kind of 56 years later, at MoMA again, announcing new style. And as you know, Zaha was one of the protagonists. And out of that evolved, eventually, parametrism and into tectonism. So these are milestones and reference points. And my book is kind of sits within this as a sequence. And I would distinguish, what's important to understand tectonism, we have to distinguish epochal styles from transitional styles and subsidiary styles. So epochal styles are long-term hegemonic styles that mark an epoch. Maybe you know them, like, you know, Renaissance, Baroque, <coughs> neoclassicism, modernism, parametricism. These are the steps. And, uh, <clears throat> and they're quite long. They could be 200 years long or 100 years, or modernism is 75 years. And from parametrism could be, you know, 50 years or more. Transitional styles, this is when you shift between these major paradigms, and they're usually triggered by socioeconomic shifts. And I will have to show you later what. But for instance, art nouveau and expressionism, they were usually short-lived phenomena, transitioning from, let's say, uh, historicism into modernism. And then postmodernism and deconstructism, I count only as transitional styles <coughs> from modernism to parametricism. And then with each of these styles, they're quite long, so you have a series of subsidiary styles. They share the basic principles, but they, have, they, they expand the repertoire, they have kind of new sets of sensibilities within. And you wouldn't, for instance, modernism, you have brutalism, you also have, of course, first the white modernism, 
<clears throat> into brutalism, metabolism, high tech, they're all modernism that can be demonstrated, not in this lecture. <laughs> so in a similar way, we have tectonism as being going on now, uh, you know, for 15 years and paramedicine going on now for nearly 30 years. In my account taking, you have a number of subsidiary styles. And that's also interesting. So you can think about, I won't believe that you come up with a new epochal style. That's not an individual project. And that must also be triggered by major socioeconomic transformations, which merit this. But the subsidiary styles are more kind of driven by internal uh, um, disciplinary um, dynamics and don't require an external shift and trigger. So here, that's very important, I think, to understand that to give substance and depth to the concept of style, that we're aligning them with socioeconomic epochs. There's nothing arbitrary about them. Um, and I'm starting, uh, actually, the real self-conscious or, let's say, architectural style with architects, with authors, and discourse only starts with the Renaissance. Although Gothic is so um, sophisticated that I call it the transition between tradition-bound building and architecture proper. And you can see here from feudalism to feudalism and the rising cities, and then the Renaissance, early capitalism, and the city-states, that's where architecture starts. And it's Renaissance, Baroque, Neoclassicism, slash Historicism, Modernism, Paramatism, that's it. That's all the epochal styles since architecture exists, the world of architecture is ever seen. And uh, we have no kind of anticipation of yet another one, that, because that would require really a fundamental socioeconomic transformation. Um, <clears throat> and you can see here what these transformations are. So we have early capitalism in the city-states, mercantilism, absolutism, the Baroque, uh, the Catholic Church, but also the French absolutist state. And then you have the 19th century, the bourgeois capitalism and the nation states, modernism, Fordism, international socialism, etc. And then this shift into the global post fordist network society, which was really triggered. A lot of times these are triggered by technological revolutions, like the industrial revolutions to begin with, and then certain social revolutions which tie in with that. Uh, anyway, so that's very um, important to realize. These are not they cannot emerge only intrinsically out of the discipline itself. Tectonism is just sitting here. So, so then you have epochal styles, subsidiary styles, transitional styles as a whole. And you can, I don't want to go too, too much in detail with that. And they distinguish passive styles, active styles, and active reflective styles. Um, <clears throat> when there is discourse, and when the discourse, that is the active style, where you have architects, writers, and, and authors publishing new drawings, theoretical projects fully designed. Before at Renaissance, there was never a building that was completely designed. They just started building, basically. And with Renaissance, you have Palladio drawing up all the plans, sections, elevations, perspectives, simulating the whole thing, and then offering that. And that could be radically novel, because you can now uh, um, argue about, that's why you need theory, but also you can show something different and make it tangible through perspective. And then you have to explain what you're trying to do here because and you don't need theory when you just keep doing what you've always been done, tradition on building. So that's the advent of architecture. But the concept of style, I'm calling it active reflective, comes in with the neoclassicism in the 19th century when they actually started to question, brought in the concept of style retrospectively by distinguishing previous epochs as styles and then asking in which style should we build. 1820, German art historian, and the art historians brought this concept of style force and brought it into architecture and then they started to ask in which style should we build in our era and <clears throat> that was in the end the answer came 100 years later with modernism. Um, but it was important through the stepping stones of Semper and others that the concept of style, without that concept and this quest and uh, gathering the moments which architecture of our era should um, include and anticipations in books like Otto Wagner's Modern Architecture at the end of the 19th century, you wouldn't have modernism without that concept of style. You wouldn't have anything else without the concept of style, like, for instance, postmodernism, deconstructivism, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, I think, is very important. And then, again, um, I'm starting to look back and see that there's been a series of steps and stages through which paramedicism has evolved uh, before tectonism. But tectonism is really the more momentous shift, the much more, and that's why it's also harder to disseminate. 
Okay, this came out, eight, I, I was publishing obviously in 2008 in Venice. I had a lecture one year before that in the Smart Geometry Conference toy presenting this idea. And that's the, I'm not going to, every lecture has this image by the way. <laughs> so uh, it doesn't mean it's the same lecture, but that is the transformation we're talking about. A rad dramatic transformation where everybody is set free to become you know, research developer, designer, where the capability of um, absorbing new ideas and innovations of the industrial machinery is hugely increased by orders of magnitude. And that means there's, there's this fantastic new dynamics of, of, of also the way we work and deliver material reproduction. So that's massive and that starts to look like this. So styles are designed programs, avant-garde styles are designed research programs, designed research lab, we into that. And this was very fruitful for me actually to, to develop this, the analogy with uh, architectural styles with scientific paradigms or so-called research programs according to Amre Lakatos who has a fantastic book on the philosophy of science, the methodology of scientific research programs. He's a professor at LSE. I've, that I've used a lot, and you can in depth uh, follow this up in Autopoiesis one point in the first book of the Autopoiesis sequence. So basically, and he's talking about heuristics when you have a paradigm, basically, or a research program, it's like the Kuhnian paradigm. You have a series of principles, and he calls them heuristics, and you distinguish negative and positive. Uh, I call them also taboos and dogmas, where you know that in, as you work through cumulatively now this, the science in the new paradigm, there are a series of new principles which you've kind of all agreed on, which are productive when you're working through. And what's interesting for me that in, in architecture we need to distinguish two types, the formal heuristics and the functional heuristics, because not only that is a new repertoire and new set of aesthetic values and methodologies of working with forms, but forms obviously are problem-solving repertoires, and we also, but we have a different understanding of the uh, problematic, the briefs, the way we understand them, the way we interpret the tasks, uh, for instance, and the, our principles by which we read and understand the, the societal dynamics we're catering for. I don't want to read them through, but what's important, there's an alignment here also. So that all systems are correlated means that everything communicates with everything within, within these kind of new network, post of network society dynamics. Okay, so, so in the book, I will go through this rehearsed parametricism and its fundamental principles because it's still relevant. Because the same heuristics on that level of abstraction, there's nothing new. Tectonism fits into this perfectly. All forms are parametric, as of course, all systems are differentiated, surely. But now with the thing is that this is, they, they, they they're this differentiated not by some kind of invented differentiation I like to express, but by, for instance, a structural logic or an environmental logic of fabrication. All systems are correlated, of course, dependency networks, parametric models, and, but they are now kind of subsystems which have this engineering rationality embedded. So that's what's new. But otherwise, on the level of abstraction which you have here, it's 100% 100 carries forward. And I looked at this. Also, in retrospect, you know, it, it had started when I wrote this up. It was going on for already 15 years. And I realized when we work, we never make any exception to this. We never do draw square, circular, triangle. We never simply repeat forms. We never just collage unrelated elements, which was a big thing in deconstructivism. College city, etc. And we say we would never do that. There's an absolute taboo, and we, you know, and we, we, we think it to be we solve the problems differently, and we have to find therefore reasons that all forms are parametrically malleable, <clears throat> that these deformation is maybe accepting information relative to site conditions, to internal, uh, you know, differentiations, and then we have multiple systems that correlate. This could be the landscape with the built environment, with the facade, with the traffic, with the, but also with different subsystems in the building. And that's what we always look for, and we don't just let, let, put layers, slap them on top of each other. We script one on top of the other. So, and we, these are, you know, absolutely, and the same if you go through some of these, uh, you know, the secular rezoning, we know we're not going to go and build a city out of secular zone. So these are absolute heuristic uh, principles. Anyway, so then I have, I go through this here, and I just want to give you a few glimpses of my style of writing 
So the indispensable concept of style, these are quotes from the book in this first chapter. The concept of style in architecture and design is an indispensable orienting category without which discursive self-reflection and self-steering within architecture are stunted. If you reject this notion, we exclude ourselves with a lot of respect to continuities of history, but also how we connect up systematically our canon repertoire, such categories we don't have them, and how they tie in with historical epochs and etc. Okay, second, paramedicine against pluralism. That's a tough one to swallow. Paramedicine is by now manifestly superior to all other styles that are still being pursued. Uh, this implies that paramedicine should sweep the market and put an end to a pluralism of styles. That resulted from modernism's crisis, so I understood that we had the pluralism when the big paradigm of modernism collapsed and was no longer the way forward, and we had different attempts to find new ways, new principles, there was a free for all, there was a, you know, the, the um, um, certain characters who were intuitive come in. Anyway, th that has been going on for too long due to ideological inertia. We got used to this. The A is a phenomenon of precisely of this, where you, where you, where everybody is kind of, all the units are independent, they're pursuing different things, uh, they don't necessarily connect up uh, easily and, and you, you don't feel the need or possibility of any kind of convergence. But it was interesting that the AA actually experienced a massive convergence in the, uh, let's say, I would say from the second half of the 90s into the second, into the mid kind of 2000s, 2005. And the similarly, there was this fantastic convergence in uh, what, what I witnessed in USA, in, in Columbia and Harvard, where literally within a very, very short space of time through some availability suddenly of new tech tools of design and some key pieces of writing, literally everybody converged onto this. Uh, people who've been doing quite different things. Uh, and, and that was actually fascinating. That was so thrilling. I think we need to find these moments. Anyway, paramedicine progress, self-criticism is again a quote based on the explicit formulation of the key societal task of architecture is crucial. The ordering of the complexity of social life process via complex legible information with spatial orders. The continued credibility of paramedicine is at stake. So we, that was my message of, I'm repeating here from Paramedicine 2.0, where I was saying we need to, there's this fantastic stuff going on, and, but it's mostly proto-engineering. We're getting these tools going, we're solving a lot of problems, we're creating all these wonderful complex forms, but we, we didn't have an answer, why should we? You know, what's the point? Um, it's, and is it only technical efficiency? And so we need to really realize the social functionality advantages of this way of working. That really grounds this style and paradigm. And by the way, paradigm is not only uh, has set, a set of kind of abstract set of rules and methodologies, but also has paradigmatic achievements, the same in science. The paradigm is also exemplary projects to look up to and study, to emulate, and we can I have some candidates, but I won't tell you. <laughs> and maybe we still have to. So anyway, so this is uh, the way, you know, I'm kind of retrospectively, it first, Parmesan was first called folding in architecture. Then blobs came up, and then these kind of swarms came up. This often technology, you know, metaballs were available. Uh, <clears throat> Ford was form Z, you had a faceted folding. And then swarmism is, you know, general components when you kind of, kind of proliferate uh, complex, geometric entities across the surface and popular surface and that became then for us, wow, we, let's do that with, with landscapes and buildings and became paramedic urbanism. So that was swarmism. But tectonism is really, these were coming very, very quickly after each other. So, so Foldism 92, Eisenman office and we did it, we started in DRL in 96, but FOA is the first paradigm project, uh, etc. And then this is maybe one of the, let's say, the paradigmatic Foldism project, Blobism, uh, Metabolism. It's very interesting that you can, so the, the, the Foldism was everything evolved from a single surface. The space never stops. It becomes floor, ripples, dishes, dips, indents, becomes wall, ceiling, and continuously open. And then we get, but there's something missing, closed rooms. So blobs give you that, but then they can start fusing with degrees and melding and articulating degrees of separation. Uh, and then you can have these kind of spaces. Anyway, the 94, very quickly, 
and uh, this is maybe probably the Blobism project. And Swarmism 96 started actually, and we did these, and you can, you know, can do the same principles applied to differentiating facade components and, and city components, if you like, and it could be also multiple intersecting swarms, swarms etc. So these are some of the projects which come out of that. Um, and tectonism, I think, was something fresh and interesting and fascinating. So I actually think that Lars Beibrock's WCT tower, tower competition, we, by the way, we also com competed with the kind of, let's say, non-tectonism, not yet tectonism. And he had this, I mean, quite crude, but he went, he looked back at Fray Otto. And he brought Fray Otto into this group of protagonists and it instantly clicked. Well, everybody was on board as well. And I particularly, because I was studying with Rod at, at Stuttgart, I knew him, and, but I didn't, and it, it was a fantastically resource. So, so that started and um, we started very quickly uh, to do tensile structures and carbon fiber shells and trusses and et cetera, et cetera. And then they, and what, you know, the phrase tectonism the, the phrase tectonics was banded about, but there's also digital tectonics, near Leach. In that, you can see uh, the last Spybrook crude attempt of using for Otto and the way it's translated. I mean, these are more dry runs. They're as ifs. I mean, the structural rationality of this isn't obviously fulfilled, but he also tried something new with elastic material, etc. Anyway, and then of course Mark Burry is in that book as well. And Mark Burry is of great bringing, you know, uh, of course Gaudi, which, which, which has fantastic tools, which, you know, also proto-tectonism tools. So that was an important publication. Atlas of Novel Tectonics uh, from Jesse Reiser, I think. And I mean, and it's true, tectonism, the tectonics of tectonism is novel tectonics. It's very different from anything you've seen in traditional, because tectonics is a very ancient, a relatively older t concept from the 19th century. And, and I think this was quite fascinating. Uh, and, and he had some great new ideas like the space frame, which was meant, which we know as a kind of, you know, this kind of endless convert Waxman kind of infinity of sameness. He said, compress it here, open a hole and edge conditions, drop something in, it ripples through the space. And this is kind of gradient announcing the event of dropping something in, radiating through where you pick up. So this was, he was a great protagonist. And I think this is all already tectonism. No, we didn't talk about it like this. We, did, we, we just kept going with the stuff. This was an, the AADOL, very important project, Maria Zioni and, and uh, Jerry Cruz with an inverted Gothic. So. Uh, inside out Gothic. Gothic is beautiful from the inside and crap from the outside, but this one has all the kind of nice compression base. It is much better than the, the Gothic because Gothic is just getting it right because it repeats the same bay. And that's it. Here is continuous parametric variation. There's also profile variation and it moves from, it has te tensile and compression in one kind of inside out super Gothic, I'd say. <laughs> And then we had, in Vienna, we were teaching obviously 15 years, we, we did similar researches. And this is a kind of uh, grid shell where Foster used generative components to do the great hall in the British Library to disappear all the differentiation. It's there. Each component is different. But he wanted to look as if it wasn't different. And we wanted to amplify and differentiate these zones. And you can imagine under such a space, there's very different situations, channels you can move, different light conditions, different height of the space. So these were the paradigms where you can see the articulated pow power of this. Um, it's not on structural rationalization. This is about generating character fields, continuously differentiated field, using the structure as the orienting differentiator. And then you can imagine matching that up with the with the, with the ground condition, which has, you know, and basically this project, and involves focus a little bit this project, in fact. And then, of course, this Algiers project, uh, where we, where you can see that we, this kind of ornamental heightening takes place, and you can make these shells very different for different purposes and different situations and different scales on the inside. Anyway, so that's where we are. Uh, and then I'll just briefly say tectonics, again, why tectonism? It's a novel tectonics, but really it's about this, it speaks obviously to this 
connection with construction, which implies engineering and fabrication and so on. And it was about how you join things, the jointing, and the, the systems build up. And there's this kind of famous book, The Tectonic of the Greeks, um, uh, where there was also the way these kind of forms get have the life of their own, an ornamental signifying life, because after the, they emerged in timber construction, it's not necessarily structurally rational anymore so much in stone construction, but it carried certain meanings and differences. And so there is this kind of important work by Semper, which I should, everybody should invite you to look at. It's a mega, it's basically Darwin's origin of species. It's a very similar thing written for, you know, the origin of species. Of, of artifactual species around the world. And Semper was looking at the great exhibition in 1851 and then developed this work, this fascinating, fascinating work. And again, uh, style, the phrase, you see here, style and the technical and tectonic art, so, uh, or practical aesthetics. So this is a great reference. And I'm, for me, it's very important that my language, you said a very specific language, that's true, but I'm, you see how much care I take in connecting my language back through all the many layers of history with important reference points. And that's why I also want to, you know, if Semper was talking about style, we should still be talking about style, because if we're not, we're not in conversation with Gottfried Semper. Anyway, so it's... And then we have, of course, Ken Frampton's Studies in Tectonic Culture. Now, Jeff Kipnis is one of the great protagonists of Parametricism, early versions, and he had nothing to do with the tectonic. It was very kind of graphic and... and very important still, but he told me you have to read <laughs> Kenneth Frampton studies in tectonic culture and you find interesting examples. Of course, I would reject this idea of poetics of construction because he has no way of instrumentalizing this. He thinks it's a craft, it's something where you have a sensitivity, you invest more in it, but what it really is, why we're investing more? Because it's actually semiology, which Kenneth Frampton doesn't get. But it's kind of hinted at in, the, in this idea of poetry. There's something else. We can't put our fingers on why this has, you know, this heightened quasi-metaphysical thing which we're pursuing in the tectonic, this expressive thing. Why on earth? But actually, if you go back further in this history of architecture, this, uh, this idea of characterfulness and expressiveness, etc., comes into architecture out of the theater, in fact, where you, where, and, 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 and very different spaces for different scenes and characters and their way of they express themselves. That language is brought into architecture. Anyway, so now just quickly looking at what the reality of tectonism, uh, <clears throat> maybe not with the full self-consciousness of being a semiological project, these, I have these three categories, three types of engineering logic, and they're compounding. They all could exist in one project, and some of our projects compound, but you can also oftentimes we foreground one of them but they're usually all of them there, maybe, or at least uh, uh, structure and fabrication, as engineering logic that resource and drive tectonic articulation. The tectonic articulation is a very important concept. So there's a structural form fighting processes, the environmental parameters as drivers, and fabrication constraints. So, so these are the chapters. And of course, Philip Bloch is amazing, and he's kind of gone back to history in this great, fantastic um, compression only stereotonic masonry vaults. And what is different here? And it's absolutely critical. He is doing this on a free form, with, on diff, across different levels. So we have a totally free plan, free to organize in complex, irregular sites with different flows, and still we can run a, 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 a perfectly structurally optimized vaulting on top of that. That's the difference between the traditional and the novel tectonics, <coughs> that it is a, a kind of basically parametricism that comes, runs on top of parametricism. And that's, and of course, Ryan Walden has the tools and it's, 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 it's total magic. What, what you, but then there's also an interest in expressiveness. So he's, he's, these kind of rifts, they're, they're part of the process and the cutting of the stone, the way it's broken off, uh, to make it more continuous on the inside. So there are certain factura elements in, coming out of the fabrication and fabrication rationality that you leave this like this. It would be co quite costly to kind of, let's say, sand all this off. 
and it tells you something. It, it makes legible these tiles, and there's characterfulness. That's what we should be looking at. And this idea of a factura is also known in sculpture, that you leave marks of the making, and that makes this particular work characterful. And Greg Lynn was onto this when you, when you do the milling and not smooth it all out, but show the tool path. And it becomes part of the ornament. And that's important. So we worked with, with this. Um, and then kind of these tools like printable stress uh, lines analysis, and you can extrude them as rips or use them to, to strategically place perforations. And the beauty of this is just amazing. And we, we, we created these kind of pavilions and structures that's code, charger, et cetera. And also with the, with the chair, so there's the structural optimization uh, with respect to uh, the shell forms through mesh relaxation and then running uh, topology optimization on top. And then, again, interpreting that through perforation on the one hand, density and thickness. And then, and these are decisions, design decisions, how you translate that forward to a certain characterfulness. So that's the compounding of structure. And then 3D printing allows you to this incredible fineness of, of this product. And this is a similar one uh, with this, where, where the final fabric, the very similar structural but very different fabrication approach where everything was developed into <coughs> developable <coughs> surfaces and gives a different character to this. And again, structural rationality, I mean, basically, this is the way you still teach the towers that they have to, they can be up to so many uh, meters, can be simple frameworks, then they, they become, uh, you know, the core does, does the carrying, then you do an exoskeleton with endoskeleton, sorry, with outriggers. At each, you jump to totally do system at each stage. This makes some sense, but then the whole tower is now flipped to that one system and there's no differentiation. And that is obviously totally driven by outward, backward, old fabrication logic and has no structural inherent logic. It's structurally irrational to do that. And it, uh, so we, we got it, and, so we, and only paradigm can pick up what we now have as a more sophisticated and much more optimized structural differentiation logic. So, so the architects who don't pick up on this, basically they do kind of very outmoded, inefficient, wasteful structures. Same when you have just the extruded beam, there should be follow a moment line. And, and otherwise you're wasting a lot of materials. So anyway, this is where we got onto this, these kind of differentiated uh, skeleton towers in different ways. I'm just going to go through this. We built uh, some of that. <laughs> Just a room to stay in. So who do I talk to? You know, Mark, I might you need a few more rooms, say in case. So if you come to come to your room, you can go 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 to your Anyway. And then, of course, topology optimization. <laughs> It's, it's fabulous because, again, what's the main point? You don't see it in these symmetry models. The main point here is that you can make a rational, optimized structure by having loads coming in asymmetrically, the support points not being all in a crystal line. Same with similar with the kind of domes and so on. They had to be always point symmetrical or crystalline. And all skeleton had to presume you have these, you can absorb a lot of these asymmetries. Anyway, so we run with this, and there's different systems. Again, you can do it in many different ways and get different characterfulness. And that's what we explored in this project at DOL, where we have also translated into steel, into concrete, into timber, but also different topology optimization tools, which have different approaches. But they're all evolutionally building on finite element analysis, which is a totally different <coughs> approach to engineering than before. And then you, you get kind of this, and then you, Lucas project. <laughs> Um, you get, you can kind of make groups and large differentiations, and you can have different subdistricts, and they all share. There's a unity across this difference, but they're also quite distinct and different in their different uh, ways. And the pro the productivity of this, you know, the student team devel developing a whole city with many districts, four different districts, and different approaches, and many of these is is is. Sorry, there was another one. Uh, is kind of staggering. Okay. Anyway, back to the office, some of these smaller projects. And then I'll just, uh, uh, go, go quickly to some of these 
uh, things. And I want to stop here a little bit because what's important, so you have on the one hand, you have a certain algorithm which is kind of an approximation, the way forces might flow like water to four uh, touch points of these kind of stretched, um, um, and there could be other you know, ways to approach that, and there's not only a single way. But then you can translate these lines of structuration in different ways. And I think it's where architecture comes in and fabrication comes in. So you can make these kind of scoops or fewer extrusions and edge reinforcement or finer extrusions. And then you can do a lot with that. So you have the same underlying and you can still differentiate out different conditions which might also reflect acoustic properties and so on. So just the, the expansion of repertoire is so beautiful and they share the same underlying rationality. Uh, and I think that's interesting, or starting to bring in cuts and lights, and that's the way you would have to make the openings. And if you do it this way, then the other one has the ribs this way, they harmonize and there's a kind of consonance and, and uh, <clears throat> echoing, let's say, resonance, one of my favorite words, between these different conditions which tie them all together. And, and this is what, we, you know, uh, also then satisfies ornamental things. This was an interesting, this whole research of shells and tensile structures and the idea of combining shells and tensile structures. So having not the tensiles always as huge pylons, but stretching and hooking on the tensile forms onto the arches and, and shell forms. Anyway, we, we won this competition, as you know, and very near to get done. But uh, uh, this is interesting. And uh, again, some of this stuff in the end gets built and is out there and can be looked at and enjoyed. And this one is just under, uh, nearly finishing and, and construction. It. Just want to quickly show this one as well. In, uh, at the GSD, I was studying, I was teaching this studio, uh, which was tectonism uh, with a semiological angle, but I didn't had the phrase tectonism yet. So this is a Fry Otto uh, 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 principle into a three D structure, whereas his was was pass networks, but load pass and pass networks have <coughs> share kind of economies. And so this was Google Campus. And what is quite interesting, so you, there's different forms of shells, large, small. They try to put different color. But what I realized is that it's great, but it's homogenous. At a certain scale, the task we have now, we can't just have this, or just white, gray parametrism would be impossible. Here you get more out of it, but it's still quite fighting the homogenization of this. Anyway, so we have then the second one was a grid shell, similar to Mannheim. Uh, and, and, and this is a beautiful project and generating a lot of courtyards and uh, similar, but again, <laughs> they would say, and then this kind of cascade of catenaries, catenaries are hang upon the catenaries, and you can see these three are like quite different and internal differentiation is very rich. You kind of find you know, sort of subcontinuaries and so on. So this was all the Google campus with briefs and courtyards and approaches filling. But then again, I realized each of them collapses into homogeneity. So we would have to then really, if you take on Google Campus of the scale, we need to have these three systems and more and maybe hybridize, et cetera. So that expanded repertoire becomes an absolute necessity actually to deliver something which isn't co collapsing into collage like you have now at, the, at, the, at, at this kind of pharmaceutical um, uh, campus in in Basel, for instance, but it just picked different architects and they're all in their own thing and it's, it, it has no unity and it's, it's visual chaos. Here we need to kind of, we have unity across these three, clearly, because it's kind of evident um, uh, unity in terms of them being parameterism, tectonism projects, anyway. And we tried this here in Vienna again. No, so I think, yeah, this was Vienna, cultural district. It's all tectonism and the different forms of shell structures and curved folding principles and reticulated and net, net structures, etc. I can't go into detail, but they're trying to make one kind of district, multi-author urbanism, uh, where each author took or takes on one or two systems and generates something of, of intricacy and in, in, in sufficiently differentiation so you don't get lost knowing in which of these 15 buildings you are, but also you know that you're still in the same kind of cultural district at the same time. So that's the raison d'etre of why this is so important when we look globally at the tasks we face as an office like Saudi Architects. Okay, environmental engineering, this Cristiano actually knows this one. Uh, we, were, we didn't put briefly onto it, but the idea is very simple with these new tools. You can have a, you, you make a composition and you have some kind of sun exposure analysis onto this and this gives you a kind of a map where you can then uh, 
hinge on um, and drive geometric brisolate um, differentiations on that, and that will be an approach which makes a lot of sense. And of course, you can do many, many different types of geometry. And you can do it in a field, all of them different, all driven by the same set of underlying parameters. There's unity through that and differentiation and, and an absolute optimization of these pre -solates. Not necessarily that this is achieved here, but that's the idea of achieving that. Because usually when you strip, throw kind of pre louver system, it's always overdimensioned on every on one time and cuts out at the same time. You use too much material and you cut out too much light everywhere where you don't need to do it. And, and this one you can be highly calibrated to each condition, particularly as you go around the building. There's some maybe another building casting a shadow, the louvers can loosen out, they, you imprint them, and then you see them, these buildings behind you, in their in reflection in, in the system, so you get a lot of more orientation, you know, sun directions and an overcast day, and there's all this legibility project. And so this is what we've done here, uh, in now finishing nearly, uh, CBD, is, uh, the Central Bank of Iraq, beautifully set on the Tigris. And so what we've done here is, we open it up to the north perfectly with the view onto the river, Itrium, and then connecting horizontal with vertical navigation space. But then you watch out how different the thing look, the project looks as we go around. By the way, the shaft comes together as a gold wall sitting there. You don't need windows. But um, <clears throat> so both structure and shading, and it looks very different as you go around. So this can become a truly a landmark. You know where you are relative to this whether you're in the south of it, the west, east, or north of it, and that is much more orienting. And so that's the kind of idea of uh, environmental-driven tectonism, but here compounded with structure as well. And it kind of fits into the geography as well. And the other flagship one, I would say, where we, it's our first lead platinum project, and we also this ambition to dr use environmentalism, not kind of machineries or embodied <coughs> carbon, somewhere on offsets, which then you can say zero, which has nothing to do with the actual architectural design, but to use morphology in the way you lay it out and embed in local climate. So this was all about capturing wind into courtyards, courtyards being this is the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, and also shading, this kind of skewing against the, the main sun direction shading, and then placing solar also, also the most exposed surface, so there suddenly is this kind of black graphics appearing, and that uh, and then otherwise windows very, very deeply cut. And you can see here the stagger of these uh, courtyard wind catching funnels and something very similar, same orientation, catching and shading for a very different ontological system, namely the fabric canopies. And that's from looking from the inside. And here you can see that the same set of parameters being played upon very differently otherwise forms, solid volumes of occupation and the kind of lightweight canopy, they kind of connect up through this, the way they both respond to an underlying parameter and also the way the open courtyard and the atrium connect up between each other. So I think this is an exemplary project, I think in this sense, and you have the open breeze coming through, uh, the staggering, the shading, etc., etc. So, And you can feel the unity of this project and also using the hexagon in differentiating uh, sizes, hexagon meaning you have more neighbors, direct neighbors between spaces, etc. I think that's quite a successful project, but I jump over that. There's a religious space also, which is now looking a certain way, but also has a difference. Uh, in the, so, and fabrication, uh, there are so many examples. I mean, that's what's been the 10 last 15 years of this movement has been engaged in this and nearly became our proto-engineers and building end effectors and building fabrication machines. I said, like, guys, that's fantastic, but we need to also ask questions, you know, about where this goes and what it means and how this deploys, etc. This is in the book also. Some other people are in the book, not only ZNJ and code. And <coughs> so, but it, what is nice about it, of course, it brings a particular physiognomy, it brings a particular characterfulness and that structure becomes ornament but is, is a universal of the history of architecture, by the way, in any way. So this can also happen today. And, you know, if you have to put bolts, then these bolts might, if they're ordered, and, and create another layer, an ornamental layer, which gives additional character to this, which will make it different from one which was welded. And maybe you want to exploit that, etc. So everything, every material 
intervention becomes has a double life in terms of its physical deliver, delivering of technical underlying performance and its expressive delivery of semiotic, let's say, performance. <coughs> and I love it, you know, so, so if you do this kind of hot wire cut, so, uh, and by the way, in a, a DL, of course, uh, Shachi's unit there, everything is tectonism always by default. <laughs> you know? And, and, then, uh, that, that, and that's the way we should work. We should all take this for granted and then go into the Pacific Earth project. Um, but of course, it's not so super easy. You have to kind of acquire the knowledge, the skills, and, and the intelligence to cooperate, cooperate with, the, with, the, with the specialists, etc. But there's a totally different kind of type of curvature than curved folding, for instance, etc. And, you know, again, tectonics of concrete printed architecture. So, again, I picked up there's people using the phrase tectonics, and tectonism should make sense uh, for, uh, as, as, as a thing. So, okay, so this was what happens, what, what we've got, what do we... Uh, uh, can see as a reality out there the movement of tectonism. Probably, I'm not sure, I mean, permatism, nobody was wanting to have that label. Nobody likes labels to be stuck on them. But I'm undeterred, you know, in the end it picked up by those who weren't involved. Anyway, so there is this idea of a post-rationalization as theoretical program, which I think is quite important. You know, 15 years after tectonism got off the ground, I'm finally presenting the book. Permedicine was the same 15 years after the, it took off and it was mature and was there and you can see it persists and it gathered momentum and it gathered a whole kind of investment of a whole generation of architects and it, it was explored and verified and then you can write it up basically. And, uh, and of course the writing up takes its own kind of five, seven years. <laughs> so that's why it gets, instead of being 10 years late, it's 15 years late. But retroactive manifestos, I mean, we've been knowing them. I mean, Graham used that phrase for the Lewis New York. So where you find something which, you know, emerged and you realize certain qualities and you want to demonstrate them, talk about them, make them an, part of an active pursuit. And then also, of course, you can say Venturi's learning from Las Vegas was a retroactive manifesto, to some extent, uh, you know, towards new architecture, right? where he looked at the, what the, the great ships and automobiles and aircrafts and industrial buildings, what they delivered and how that could be an architecture. So all architectural manifestos are to some extent retro. Active because you can't just invent into the blue. It makes no sense. It's it's gonna it's hopeless, and you won't have anybody audience. And so so, so that, I'm mean, using this phrase. <clears throat> the owl of Minerva spreads its wings only with the falling of the dusk. What does that mean? <laughs> That's kind of from Hegel, the preface to the philosophy of right. Because if you think about the kind of modern constitutional state, it wasn't also it wasn't an invention by somebody. Anyway, so so. And, and that's the kind of spirit <clears throat> that this something evolves with many authors, actors, many resistances it overcomes, and it accumulates a rationality which you probably don't, nobody has an encompassing view of. So Hegel realizes that with world history, so, and he also warns in a sense against kind of inventing a totally new world. So concerning the desire to teach the world what it ought to be, right? I'm not doing this, to some extent. <laughs> You, uh, um, for such a purpose, philosophy always comes too late. Philosophy as the thought of the world does not appear until reality has completed its formative process. He goes on, only in the maturity of reality does the ideal appear as counterpart to the real, apprehends the real world in its substance and shapes it into an intellectual realm. We can then work with, I would argue. The content which is already rational, must win the form of explicit rationality and stand up as well-founded to critical thinking. So all of that you can read in what I'm trying to do with this book. Um, then he's going a bit, I would say, I would criticize the last phrase, the last paragraph, when philosophy paints its gray and gray, a form of life has grown mature, and by means of gray, it cannot be rejuvenated, but only known. The owl of Minerva takes its flight only when the shades of night are gathering. So, no. I'm, I think there is a lot of energy and rejuvenation potential in that very fact of reflective appropriation. Okay? And so he, there's a kind of pessimist. He thought 
Prussian state this time was the absolute of. And then Marx said, philosophy is not only there to be in interpreting the world, it's there to change the world. And I say that too, but also Marx knew there's a lot of weight until he reaches a kind of more pessimistic conclusion. When you try to change the world, you better understand the world. And you just midwifing what's already coming. <clears throat> that also applies to architecture. So, and we have to distinguish empirical versus reconstructive versus normative theory. And what I'm talking about is a reconstructive, which maybe then turns, it's based on the empirical, becomes reconstructive, and then maybe has a normative element, but it's not an invented one. Anyway, so my point here is architectural theory understood as rational reconstruction of an evolved and always already theory guided practice. So there's a strange dialectic. There's always been theory guided, then it evolves into something else which needs to be re theorized. And then, and the same with the, with the, with the guys who when Hegel writes the, uh, about the kind of constitutional republic, uh, there have been many other events, not only the French Revolution, but many other theorists, Montesquieu, etc., <coughs> Hobbes, etc. So that's always folded in, but it is retroactive and prospective. So rational reconstruction means for me here, in terms of tectonism, explanation and justification. To systematize and consolidate gains, to disseminate and broaden the movement, to inspire and guide further research and development, to usher into enhanced architectural competency. So the proposition is my writings propose contribution to the movement and style of tectonism beyond the endorsement, naming, and rationalization, and I think these are non-trivial contributions, is to link up this movement's work with the project of architectural semiology. I guess you heard me use that phrase before. Uh, tectonism is able to deliver a huge boost to architectural semiology due to the vastly enhanced expressive power and repertoire of tectonism but also to be fully redeemed in its potential, it needs to be used as such. That's my proposition. This attempt to awaken the interest of the movement for an explicit engagement with semiology is a central part of my call for the movement to shift its primary focus from technical functionality to social functionality, as laid out in Argit for Premise 2.0. So if you take social functionality serious, what would be the link you know, for these technical expertises and to deliver towards. That's the link, the semiology uh, articulation project, architecture, as co its communication capacity is the link. So the enhanced tectonism, which isn't the currently existing one I've been kind of reviewing, uh, is upgrading architecture via tectonic articulation. That means morphologies, both global forms and details, delivered by various types of engineering optimization are selected, and there's always many to select from, very important, visually enhanced and then orchestrated in the ambition to design an information-rich environment that conspicuously and eloquently communicates its organization and offerings to end users, thereby facilitating navigation and interaction that is enhancing social functionality. So that needs to be thinking in. You can make a photograph of it <laughs> and get into all the layers of that. I think that would be the, the, the enhanced tectonism I'm trying to go for. Okay, so... There's an interesting congeniality of parametrism and tectonism with semiology, even in its unconscious form. Because we're talking about rule-based script dependency relations, that means functions, between input and output parameters. And, the output, and some of the input parameters could be already other physical systems or just constraint parameters. Uh, this can be interpreted as representation or a signifi signification relation. And I think that's quite important. And, and, and uh, it's interesting in mathematics, function in German is Abbildung. And that means also like representation. Or if you think about the mapping, one maps onto the other. It's, it's very much a representation relation. If you took an underlying kind of condition and you manifest it through rule base into a physiognomy, then you can infer back. And we talk a lot about the inference potential. And that a lot of this comes natural for free with parametricism and tectonism. But we need to systematize it. 
We need to own it and work with it and run with it. And this is one of the projects I've been used to show so much from DRL. Unfortunately, I forgot the T and year. It's probably 2005 or something like this. Now you can see that you have the kind of fun, you know, the kind of stress analysis, and then you can have different way of mapping off it a skeleton, but with very different characters. And then you you can impose a threshold where this flips from close to open. You can then pull a script off, the, the, the slab pulls away from that opening. And then you have a core point and different ways of radiating ribs. Now, simply because there's, they're differently far away from the perimeter, you get differently deep ribs. So when you see a deep rib, you know you're far away from the core point. So these are all inference potentials. And it also looks incredibly organic and beautiful if you start working like this. And, but it's also speaking, it's legible, it's legibility. And if you, you, you could learn the grammar and, and information and re, you can retrieve all this information. And then the kind of facade is kind of stripped over this and it opens up where the slab pulls back and you have these kind of atrium voids behind, et cetera, et cetera. So a kind of masterful project, which and I really apologize that I forgot who the authors were. They might be sitting in this room. <laughs> um, <clears throat> So this tectonic articulation and service of signification, that's the point I'm adding. Engineering logic delivers technology and double up as expressive resources of articulation. And the advantages of a tectonic articulation, because you can also could have unconstrained graphic articulation. Like we used, you know, you can just, okay, I have this structure and I have this material in brickwork, I just plaster over it all in white. And now I'm kind of painting color coding onto it, the graphic or something. But <clears throat> there are two problems with this. One is an economy. I have already this kind of structure. It's already systematically uh, differentiated. It's already recognizing the size of the room behind imprints as a bigger window, which imprints as a larger kind of edge framing, et cetera, et cetera. If you're in a big open space, you can, you can sense, if you see the structure, you know where is the, uh, where is the center point of that, where is the deepest the further expanse of the space versus the narrow, because you're spanning in the narrow, etc. There's sort of an economy, but also there's credibility through these indexicalities. If you do it this way, I mean, Zaha always used to say, kind of Eisenman, all this sheet rock architecture, it's like stage set. It could all be kind of chimerical. It could all be a big lie. <laughs> so, so, but if you, you know, if you, so credibility is a so. The disadvantage is you have a certain degree of a pre-constrained repertoire, you might think, at, of a disadvantage, but I don't think because what do you have instead? You have your imagination, but it's usually quite poor with imagining things. We don't come up with new things easily. So this stuff, that's what's the excitement about in this discipline, that these kind of new techniques and rationalities bring up new forms, so it's intricate, a new kind of many different ways or new kind of stimulation. So this, this disadvantage might be even a bit advantage that it becomes an abstract machine of delivering expressive material to us. And it comes with this extra index credibility through indexicality. And you can, of course, you have to orchestrate it. So it's quite interesting. You would just randomly pick up how you would orchestrate. These are the four pavilions, or first four pavilions of uh, Achim Engels kind of thing. And you can see that you can make a network a system of signification, of contrast and similitudes, the way if curiously these two link, everything is, they're always similar and different. So they're similar in, in geometric articulation, but they're quite different in materiality. They're different and similar in, in, in terms of uh, geometry versus materiality, and again upwards as well. So the similarity across, always similar similitude and difference in both directions. So you can make this kind of matrix of, of and I would have to demonstrate this, you could, that uh, social institutions, they also have always similarities and differences. And you have this kind of overlap of multiple dimensions of distinction in the social world. And that's what you can use. Anyway, so, <clears throat> and we need to know that really architecture is not about shelter, but about ordering of social processes. And that is really social rather than technical functionality. And it, it's, this order is mostly delivered via communicating demarcations. Of course, it's also delivered by sheer distance, physical distance, or hard boundary walls which separate. But in a free and open and more high 
production, high performance environments like in Google campus and similar places, there's no physical walls and everything is kind of through communicated demarcations you get the order. And um, I think that's very important, that delivering the capacity. And it was always like this, that you had, for instance, a Doric, Yone, Corinthian, and they were systematically used on different levels of lightness, uh, that you have the rustication, you know, it's actually you weakening the actual stone by cutting deeper uh, joints to have this strong shadow and roughing up the stone. But this is semiology where you want to distinguish the, you know, the, the ground floor rough quarters, which has kitchens and horses and workshops from the Piano Nobili and from the upper chambers, etc. So there's always been this use of tectonic articulation, if you like, but of course it's not novel tectonics, it's traditional tectonics. And again, when we do use in this project, which is in tectonism, but use all the materials we have, if tarmac surface, concrete surface, light posts, uh, and lampshades, etc., as these swarm formations, these connections, using them as a formal articulator repertoire, and suddenly that means that this building, which could have been disappearing as a series of sheds, two car parks, a tram station, and a, and a bus station. You can imagine how this would have disappeared in this kind of no man's land, inconspicuous, unlegible, non findable and how strongly this comes in, that we connect the two car parks into one system, connect up, the lampposts become the, the columns, the demarcation lines become the lights, the, you see the cut coming in of the trains and the buses, and it's a unified park and ride scheme. And that's what we mean by the compositional stance. And that becomes even more effective if that repertoire is not just the older parametrism repertoire, but the full repertoire of tectonism. But that's the spirit. And then you look at, strangely, that uh, because they have con the, the floor and ceiling are look very similar, uh, because they're, they share nothing physically and technically, but they share the communication tasks, so that's why they're <coughs> assimilated to each other to, to, to have this navigation orienting capacity. And that's what, uh, that, that's the kind of thing we need to do. Similar in a building like this where we use the natural light to flow you through, we use the tilt, bring you back to the, the entrance, we use different materialities to distinguish the learning center from the library, etc. And again, when, we, when we're doing a whole university campus, uh, you can have, di you know, different shape forms and different types of shells, smooth, squeezed, um, uh, curved, so uh, faceted, and then kind of make the combinatorics. And then you build an algebra grammar of fusing and connecting with several shells and how they interface to make these kind of complex shells, <coughs> how they get nested in the larger shells. And by the way, shells are a great accident of history. So if, if you make a shell form, you, the, the, the unit of space becomes more conspicuous. You have a flat ceiling, it all disappears into, into illegibility. But the shell could be open on the ground, but it articulates the space. It's visible in the elevation. There's many th interesting things about it. Anyway, so these are the kind of DRLs, um, <clears throat> semiology project, and then you can have different uh, reticulations and patterns applied to this for different functions because you have that network of similarity and differences where you have different schools, the schools of science, humanities, the arts, and uh, they all have seminar rooms and, and, and workshop spaces and, and libraries and so on. So you have these multiple connecting um, um, notions where you have to articulate the library in three different ways. So you need to see the library in this and you need to see that the, 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 the library is also with the auditorium and the workspaces of the humanities, so it's this double encoding. And that's, you can then go literally use the, the, you know, the optimized forms and they become articulation conditions. And then you develop uh, these distinct, um, you know, kind of maybe make extra conspicuous, hypervisualized, and you generate a kind of campus which has this, uh, Meanings are better. Of course, when you look at it now, you don't get it, but you, you live in this, you can pick it up and you, you will get it as you learn the language, like you learn the language when you, in practice, engage as a child. So that is where, he, where these things mean something and tell you something and are information which and guide you and orient you in otherwise very complex uh, situations. So, and I'm 
run a lot of time. There's another in the book. Please, you can follow this one up. A very interesting um, um, grammar and semiology of convex to convex, uh, concave spaces <coughs> versus totally open and unbounded spaces. And then each of these comes in parametric variations and in between and or in very different forms, but they all share the base characteristics. So you have a lot of variability. You can in between, you then have a kind of a grammar of uh, boundary conditions, full and closed, and then different ways of combining and nesting them, different ways of overlapping them, where two concave spaces generate a concave space, where two concave spaces generate a convex space, etc., or convex and concave, uh, convex. And you think that through whether that makes sense in terms of the social situation, whether they can combine like this, and then you can roll that out and three-dimensionalize this, and then you have the whole thing as a gradient from uh, uh, open to more closed, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and then you go the same repertoire you might use for the furnishings, where the concave, uh, uh, meandering, uh, amorphous big table is the working desk, and the convex is always the meeting zone, etc., etc., etc. So that would be something. And I stop with this, and you can imagine if there's intricately embedded associations, like words have associations, where you have used them before and the connection and our new mega supercomputer here makes all these connections. The problem is in the built environment there is very little, it's inert, it's degenerate. There is a lot of random noise where a lot of these forms mean very little. And we have only a few cliches, so, but we could, if we systematically work it, I think we could take it in like this and understand a lot of things. We can learn to run our hand across a kind of dot matrix and take in a whole discourse. Somebody could have been, could read that book like this, so the capacity, if we deliver and transform the built environment into this text, and it could be dynamic text, responsive environments, we could take it in. We have an enormous capacity to do that, and it would empower us enormously, and we can do that both in the physical world and in the virtual world, in the metaverse, and that's where I stop, and open for questions. Hello, thank you. Super interesting talk. Uh, one of the tables you showed was um, the connected the architectural epoch to uh, politics, and I think you had uh, modernism, um, international socialism. Is that right? So I'd be really interested if, uh, and there's a slight part B to this question, I'd be very interested if you could speak to your understanding of the relationship of uh, tectonism and parametricism to <clears throat> politics. Obviously, you've written some really interesting and quite controversial in the profession stuff some years back. Uh, and... Uh, the part B is, I'm just wondering if perhaps the uh, election of Javier Millet in Argentina offers some really interesting possibilities. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, it's interesting. And he's obviously misunderstood and misclassified already by the mass media. But very important point. So when I align modernism, yes, with international socialism, that will be, the, I guess, the, the most evolved and um, political expression of this, but I would first talk about the socio-economic epoch, which is Fordism in this case, right? And which has a number of characters. It's not only a technical paradigm. It's also uh, it has a, you know Fordism means also the first time that the industrial revolution, the industrialization, touched fully with and the machines, and the machinic. The, the, the life of inside the city. Because before the, you had the factories were not part of Gentile city life. But with Fordism, you have you know, the car, the Ford, Ford model, uh, Ford T, and you have washing machines, and you have a lot of uh, and, and trams and trains, and, <clears throat> and you, you have uh, a, everybody participating in the new level of lifestyle because of this massive mechanical mass reproduction of including housing, the car, the packaged holiday, industrial foods, uh, industrial clothing, the washing machine, the TV, the radio, and so on. This, this consumption package was universally rolled out, and it wouldn't have 
<clears throat> made much sense to have a lot of differentiation in income. Everybody was earning that to some extent in the, in the, in the, the principle of that. It was very different from the previous era of the 19th century where you had this laissez-faire capitalism where you had, for instance, instead of having two or three steel factories or car factories, you had thousands of steel shops and maybe carriage shops. So this is massive concentration and then mechanization to the assembly line paradigm, which set up a totally different also social dynamic, which then expresses itself in the social revolutions uh, post World War One. Also, you need this cataclysmic thing to unleash this, but it would have come anyway. It maybe was accelerated through this. And then, oh, you know, why I'm saying international socialism, because all the capitalist countries became kind of quasi-socialist anyway, whether it was actual communists or it was the social democratic parties like in Germany or it was the way uh, the British um, in nationalized the economy and France and so on and so forth. So that was the thing. And then the transformation into post fordism that's what's parametrism tracking in a way. And the first response of architecture was postmodernism and deconstructism and then parametrism really fully solving this issue. This is the computational revolution, telecommunication and computation and flexible specialization, robotics, uh, this enormous flexible tooling instead of huge assembly lines. And that what did you have? You have also these big conglomerates breaking up, uh, network organizations, outsourcing, re-inhabiting of the historic center because you need this. You don't sit on the green field with a huge bureaucracy, which only, which only does for the next 20 years one thing and you need command control. You have this kind of network of firms. And that would express itself already in, in postmodernism, urban renaissance or even deconstructism. All these projects are embedding themselves. It's relatively small incisions, transformations of the historic center, you know, <clears throat> layering on top, sometimes quite iconic with Kurt Himmel, et cetera. And, and, but at the same time, the neoliberal, uh, on the political front, this kind of post world is next world society, which was in the theorized by Marxists, on the, in the political front, this was the Thatcher and Reagan revolution. The deregulation, the privatization of everything, uh, the, uh, uh, the globalization, before you had closed national economies. And that makes sense, and that gave, gave, that's really delivering that kind of wave of productivity gains and prosperity gains which are very, very different. It was, it was great. I grew up in the, in the, in, in, in the 60s. And um, yes, 60 million Germans had, they all had the, some kind of house flowing water, heating, <coughs> television, a packaged holiday, a car in front. So they all had the lifestyle which was much higher than the kind of French king of 300 years ago. But looking at it back now, you know, with, with, with one TV or two TV channels, everybody eating the same packaged uh, uh, industrialized bread, uh, uh, doing this kind of, uh, uh, you know, once this nine to five work routines, uh, boring for the next, for the whole, for your whole life, etc. Nobody want to go back with that. We're in a totally different, more exciting, f fantastic, refreshing and, and exuberant uh, world, and we need to recognize where it comes from, technology, and what would be the political expression, what would be the architectural expression, and that's what I speak to. I'm also interested in what would be the political expression, but I, that's not where, uh, you know, th that we can't fight that out here. And we can make them to some extent independent, because if you have the socioeconomic uh, system, which now other subsystems, for instance, the law, the political process, architectural and planning and urbanization development process and its values and categories and, and, and distinctions, they all have to adapt to this kind of underlying dynamic of a new technologically, ultimately technologically driven socioeconomic transformation. And uh, so I have my views about what the political should be because it also starts to interfere heavily in the way we as architects can actually develop urbanism in the city or buildings in the city. It's, it's just way too constrained. So I've, I've got, uh, I've got my position, but my first task here is to say that parametrism tectonism is, is very congenial to this. It's, 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 it's all this open composition, this kind of free, uh, uh, it's not closed, it's ever evolving, it's flexible, adaptive, et cetera, et cetera. That was what I, feel I recognize, and that's, that's the kind of uh, task we're looking out for, uh, you know, in terms of 
Creative Industry Hub doing major mixed-use buildings, doing something like Google Campus. Although Google Campus, unfortunately, is, I mean, Silicon Valley is a ro the wrong urban models model. They need kind of suburbia stuck from the forest area when they were chip building. Anyway, so this is where, where I think uh, parametrism sits. It's the answer of architecture to that socioeconomic transformation, of course, which is also still ongoing. Uh, still continuing, and I don't think we've gone into a different direction and redeveloping our architecture. That's congenial, that's the epochal style. Because that's the epoch. Yeah? Mile? Ah, Mile. <laughs> Mile. Well, he's a libertarian, that has to be emphasized. And not right wing and populist, that's not relevant. Relevancy here is that he has a a strongly libertarian outlook, and is it precisely what Latin America needs, which was kind of stuck in kind of semi-socialism and reverting back to semi-socialism with disastrous consequences for prosperity. And prosperity is really what we have to focus on. If you foreground the sense of social justice and in, in the contemporary redistribution, zero some kind of place, is wrong. Prosperity is the driver because it's cumulative. If you grow for 3-4% a year, compounding in 20 years, there's monumental changes to your life, to everybody's life. Plus, on top of that, you grow individually. But the average is already nearly you know, doubled. And if you give up on this, if we had 15 years of zero growth, zero productivity growth, Japan is going backwards. So it means they're working harder and harder for less. That's insane. So that will, in the end, even though they've been so wealthy, it will, in the end, kind of, no uh, social process can survive that. So prosperity is the key, and we need to understand the prosperity, the, the, the mechanisms which unleash prosperity potentials. And I think that's my libertarian outlook. Um, and that's, look, Mile, I don't know. I mean, he has some advisors. He has some interesting organizations who will support him. Uh, uh, there's a libertarian world community of economists and and activists who will probably, he can hopefully draw on. And the big problem is, does it, will there be enough time to make the, make the difference visible? Patrick, I've yeah. got a question. Thanks very sure. much. You mentioned at the beginning your interest in industrial design. Do you see your buildings as being industrial products? So that's the first question. And the second one is, if it is an industrial product, do you believe in built-in obsolescence in buildings? <coughs> Uh, no, I don't think them as industrial products. I mean, there, there is a, look. There's congeniality. Uh, so, so principles of pragmatism are applicable to to, um, to industrial design as well as to to architecture. But there are also specifics in these each discipline. So you can't reduce the building to uh, to industrial product because you can't you can't lift it off and take it everywhere. It's not ubiquitously. It, it it's embedded in the in a, in a, in a texture and a background. And, and, and that's, that's one big difference, also the scale of operation. Uh, you, you don't have, in, in, the, in modernism it looked more similar. In the Bauhaus it looked more similar. You, you, you had this idea of a universal kind of st standard minimal house of existence, which you treat like an industrial product, and you, 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 you run it and you pop it and populate it <coughs> around the world indiscriminately, put some kind of energy source to it, and you have a ubiquitous product. No, architecture isn't working like this. It is much more contextual, and every building is unique with respect to place and purpose, with respect to the audiences, that means, and the event scenarios, and there could be multiple readings and use cases and audience intersecting, and they're, they're very unique, and, but we have the capacity to cope with that. We have the capacity to deal with it, with these adaptive strategies, with also a new, I didn't talk about today, you know, occupancy simulation, like what I call life process, agent-based life process simulations with differentiated agent, etc. So, no, it's 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 it is distinct, and uh, you can't have the same. When we do modular, we do parametric modularity, where the pa where the module is a genotype, which has many different phenotypical expressions and comes into conjunction. In, with, with other components, quite exciting to, to, to work this way. So that makes it a, bit, a little bit similar to an industrial product. But because it's not uh, free-floating, it's very, very different. Yeah. Hello. Okay. 
thank you very much for this speech. Uh, so my, I have a couple of questions actually. My first is, from your explanation, tectonics seems to be utilization of engineering logics and you had some categorization, structural form finding, mm. environmental drivers and fabrication methods. And I think yeah, it could be very beneficial in material efficiency and environmental responsiveness. But how does this style matter? How does this material efficiency or environmental responsiveness matter in some things your office is currently working on, like the metaverse? <clears throat> well, okay, the metaverse doesn't have this. They have, it has its other engineering constraints, namely refresh rates and, and polygon counts. It's interesting, so that everything we're talking about here in terms of the semiological project, let's say the feminal project, the organizational project, and framing communicative interaction um, uh, and, and empowering people through letting them navigate complex environments and many offerings, that's in the metaverse too, except all the engineering stack disappears. It's interesting because the, there's a double function for all the, let's say, formals and, and, and visual language structures out of tectonism. You could transplant them into the metaverse too. They would lose their technical functionality, but they would maintain their semiological <coughs> functionality. <coughs> but also, but then they would, this will also evolve into other conditions. But I think they will also need to remain some kind of interfacing and continuity between these two aspects of our lives because it's still an integrated life, professional life, which sh where you shift between physical encounters, hybrid events and space into purely virtual. And you, you, you want, and sometimes you have windows into virtual in real spaces, etc. So they should remain connected. But the, and the technical thing itself is ultimately engineering responsibility. <clears throat> but of course, we want to be as you know, light-footed environmentally as possible. We want to be structurally as efficient as possible. Also, just to not have these kind of huge, we used to have in our older projects, these huge posse spaces, multi, several meters of space trussing, lost space, <clears throat> as well as huge plant rooms. You don't want, they get in the way, literally get in the way at a certain point of getting the, the space interaction, but also you don't want to be burdening your client and the world with this excessive uh, technical mismanagement. So it's a value in itself, and we are congenial, and we are proto-engineering, but ultimately the delivery of this is engineering. We need them to be very proactive and collaborative and pick up that, that attitude. <coughs> so it's a value in its own right, but it's not the disciplinary primary uh, um, let's say, responsibility, which is really the social functioning of these spaces. And with the minimal constraint on the technical sides, which comes ultimately the engineering responsibility. But we need to be very congenial and cooperative. And that shows up in something like tectonism is no other style it can. So all the other characters in, who, are, who are competing with, they find it very hard to integrate these sophisticated engineering concepts into the architecture, basically. They can't because they want this kind of minimalist <coughs> portal frame and, and, that, that, and, and they want this uniform facade and that is kind of insensitive. So, so, so there's a kind of schism, outmodedness. Uh, it's not only because these projects which we see, I mean, all other styles are retro styles, literally. There's, you tell me another of these contemporary styles which is different as other than parameters. I mean, it's a very large encompassing kind of concept. They're all retro, means they're doing things we could have done 100 years ago, which is already kind of, why do you need an academic discipline to, to kind of do that? But also it is then inherently tied in with <clears throat> these kind of retrograde and wasteful technical systems. But I'm emphasizing here, obviously, the social functionality. And there, in the metaverse, that's huge congeniality across, so we can all migrate seamlessly into the metaverse. The, total, the engineering stack is totally left, swapped, but the design is, uh, principles uh, of parallelism are absolutely continuous. Um, okay, uh, when, sorry, sorry when, just another question, last question. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so uh, my second question is, you have some examples of buildings already built and some unbuilt projects on tectonism. Uh, one I was looking for, 
uh, I'm not sure if it's in the book, but it's maybe the most basic, to me, basic unit of like architecture, like housing. So are there applications of this style in housing? And if yeah, not, yeah, yeah. okay, there are. Because I was suggesting to myself that it might be a luxury, the the use of these tools to kind of, the deployment of these tools in optimizing form, it might not be so necessary for things as fundam as basic as singular houses. So I want to know the I don't have it in a book, but there's a project that's flashed up, which is in Roatan, which is uh, <clears throat> interesting. It's a, it's a parametric timber modules. There's also a participatory design process where people share a platform. This where the Shaj's project in the DRL transformed and applied within ZHA. And that has um, timber shell components, and it has um, columns, uh, which, which flare out to have cantilevering spaces. And so it's sophisticated engineering, and there's this idea of fabrication comes very strongly in. This is called circular factory or a local robotic factory which has been shipped uh, on site where these things are now adaptively uh, created to, to accumulate that as, as the kind of participatory design process delivers a kind of dif differentiated community uh, that is residential, it's quite unusual, and it's, but it's, these things are eventually very labor-saving and very economically advantageous too. In the transition period where these things are new and firms have to invest first and the amortization will take a while, they are still a bit boutique sometimes, and, but, but there are enough companies, I think it's matured enough that you are... Um, economically competitive with this approach and can deliver this variation virtually for free. It's like when you, you know, when we shifted from kind of <clears throat> offset printing to laser printing, you can make a thousand different images. It's cost the same as if you, and the same as basically through robotic fabrication, reprogramming the robot, robot Eventually, it will be quite smooth and varied. Of course, we have these two robots or one robot in our, in our studio, and it is still a lot of skill, a lot of try and error to calibrate. So we're in this transition phase. But the promise, of course, is that eventually it is not only environmentally, but also economically unbeatable with the traditional building systems, particularly if you combine modularity with this variability, this parametric adaptability. And there's this housing project, which, uh, which you can look up in Roatan, which, by the way, a libertarian <laughs> society, which has been nascent in indie creation in, in Honduras, very, very exciting. <clears throat> um, when, when Ken Frampton wrote his uh, studies in tectonic form, yeah. uh, he expressly announced it as an attempt to recover from the modernist, 20th, 20th century modernist emphasis on space, the factor of tectonics that has run through the actual yeah. built work of yeah. the modern masters that he, he, that he described. Now, modernism was often identified with that special turn that occurs around 1890 with Schmalzoff and his circle. Yeah. where space becomes a creatress, or architecture becomes a creatress of, our, of space. Yeah. And this was in contrast to the almost anxiety about tectonics that prevailed in the mid-19th century uh, with people like Zemper and Ruskin, who were desperate to recover <coughs> some kind of integrity and continuity between the new structural systems and the actual surface quality and materiality of the buildings around them, hence the anxieties about ornament versus sure. structure. And in modernism, especially with the arrival of reinforced concrete, which appears to have to offer no tectonic evidence whatsoever of the relation between its inner structure and its surface, uh, you get with, by 1920, you get people like uh, um, uh, Frederick Kiesler and um, Van Doesburg, <coughs> producing works that seem to have zero tectonic value whatsoever. The City in Space by Kiesler just seems to hover there like a sure. magical assembly of forms, rather like a, a Malievich uh, painting. Now, um, 
I can see the uh, turn of return to tectonics that you've described since the 1990s, a very interesting little kind of genealogy that you produced there. The question is, where does your own work sit in relation <coughs> to this dialectic between defining a building as a physical thing and defining a building as an assemblage of spaces? What is the school? Is it this space that we're in, or is it those walls and columns around us? And the tectonics always seems to be relating mostly to the physical object, whereas you seem to be trying to reach out to tectonics becoming an articulation of space. So is it a, a Hegelian triad we have here, uh, synthesis, antithesis, synthesis? I would hope so. <laughs> Very, thanks a lot for a very uh, interesting and elaborate question. I mean, you make me think about it. It is, it is, it is interesting. Yes, so, so I'm interested in ultimately articulation of, um, let's say, um, spaces of engagement and interaction of, of social situations, articulating social situations three-dimensionally for, for users to join, enter, have awareness about it, read the social protocols of interaction of the clues, which includes proportion, and position, as well as articulation through materiality, color, light, levels, many, many dimensions of articulating the social situation. Space itself is still a little bit abstract. But I do think, it's interesting, what makes me think is, I, I think it's very exciting and important step that in, through Schmazo, and then uh, the way it was picked up in, by the modernists, in the uh, early 20s, this idea of liberating the task of architecture away from delivering artifacts, which often were at the same time already archetypes and fixed entities which come with form and function and materiality baked in. The 19th century is these kind of rigid typologies. You even see them in Art Nouveau. Art Nouveau has vague typologically classical forms and you had before, you had eclecticism already start to play with the ornament, but they were very distinct, you know, the church, the palace, uh, the museum, which uh, was versions of the palace, etc. And there were all these kind of closed entities. So what space, the, the redefinition of the architectural task fundamentally as the formation of space and spaces is very important. Raumgestaltung uh, gestalt, uh, is... Uh, is because of the level of abstraction, the degrees of freedom to break out from these preconceived forms and also focus on the interaction, on, the, on what's, what's to be contained and, and differentiated. I think this was very important, but you're right. In the first instance, it denied all of this tectonic material because it probably wasn't the way. And you have this white modernism, which was super abstract. Uh, just, as I said, everything just white plasters or like the stretched canvas. And you denied uh, what was behind. But actually, a lot of the time it was still brick. <laughs> they wanted it to be, uh, you know, uh, steel and concrete. And it was interesting that this <clears throat> uh, gradually came back in the Corbusier's work where he used stone or the Italians in the 30s. So the 20s was all this abstract, white, pure space. And to show that, I think it was an important step. So sometimes you need to build up and reach somewhere through steps of isolating sub-problems and issues. And, and, and also abstract art played a huge role in space, Co dialectically with the concept of space, opening up composition in a totally different and new way, throwing proportion, symmetry, and topology overboard. I think it was very, very important. But it's interesting how it creeped in through the 30s, 40s, and then in brutalism in the 50s, it, it becomes interesting. Uh, and, and, and also with people like Alto. With, so when Frampton looks back, his examples are those, you're quite right, where, they, where they, they want, there wants to be a kind of retrieval of some of that uh, materiality, the tectonic, which was kind of hidden behind the whitewashed abstract cubism of, war, of white, you know, white modernism. It's very interesting. So, but, but it was also then nearly very soon it became back, architecture must speak. And the semiological project, which, which, which came in in the 60s and 70s, 
um, you know, was going back and trying to retrieve a lot of typological motifs, but also I think uh, it, it could, it, that was a maybe mistake in my view, but to have uh, more uh, new typologies and also new tectonic uh, possibilities to bring them into to articulating. And I think it, thanks a lot for that, and that's the way I view it. Um, in the end, I don't decide. Um, I think, uh, as I said, I'm about articulating the, the social process <clears throat> through um, um, spatial configurations, which are then also need material, material kind of uh, embodiment, which becomes semi-logical. So I you always going for metamorphosis rather than typology. Yes. I mean, there's this, one of the slogans used to be from, from typology to topology. To undo this, to decode, that was deconstructism also, to, to, to erase, and you see, you see it also in, when you have social revolutions in the, in the 70s with the hippie movement and things like super studio and Italian furniture, the kind of dissolution of all these normal types in the furnishing world. But I do believe that ultimately we have to, there will still be some kind of typology, even if we allow for in-betweening, for hybridization, there still will be a basic typology of types of social engagement which drives uh, societal life. I, I do think we can't get away from this. So, so, so from typology, topology is, is not really the full story. Uh, we then kind of have to, have to refine a larger panoply of types but allowing now parametric types also on the social front. Parametrically variable event scenarios and one might type of event might bleep, bleed into another, but there will be, there's a distinction between public lecture and the kind of informal seminar versus uh, other things you might be doing in, in a school. And these, these are types which have a degree of solidity and validity and that, that, that cannot be overcome. But <clears throat> Um, I have a question. Yeah. Um, you describe parametricism as a new style of architecture. Uh, when does talking about style uh, stops being style and becomes a method or a technique to design with parametric uh, <coughs> metrics, as the word describes? And when does it become just a style? And wouldn't it be necessary to use a different word to describe one or the other? Yeah, it's a very interesting question. I mean, the, the notion of style comes from stylus, the pen. And you can think about that, you know, if different ways of, even just if you use a brush versus using a, a pencil, you're using something else that will imprint on the artifact systematically. So that generates some kind of style. The aquarelle, uh, the watercolor painting versus the oil painting there. There's, th that's not the way we use style, but there's something towards style. And so, if, so, of course, there's always going to be um, some kind of set of constraints through the methods you're using. So there's a definite dependency relationship between <clears throat> the, the techniques and tools of design and the stylistic outcome of, of the design. There's a connection there. It's not necessarily one-to-one, -one, <clears throat> but uh, that's an important. So you need to, and you realize if you want to, participate in a certain style that you will have to actually realize you actually have to acquire the techniques and knowledge and, and skills. I think you also need to acquire language you know, of critiquing and filtering and selecting out of the stuff you're producing, those which you want to do, develop further and which features to amplify and repeat and vary and which features to avoid, etc. So it's not only <clears throat> That's the kind of heuristic principles. So in my theory of style, I'm not bringing it down in the very formless way to the particulars of techniques, but in my writings, I'm talking a lot about the various types of software at various stages available and how they input themselves. <clears throat> and that, you know, the wonderful world of Grasshopper and with all these plugins is obviously the world of tectonism, which makes that widely available and continue, is a huge research program of continuously bringing in more tools, more science, making that efficient and allowing us to interface and interconnect with these knowledges and, and implications in the early design stage processes. So, so for instance, that is a very strong correlation and dependency relationship. 
<clears throat> it's not an absolute. I mean, if you want to, if you're super talented and you want to kind of kill yourself, I mean, we did parametricism by hand in the 1980s, you know, pre proto parametricism, but it was, you know, incredibly painful and difficult. And, um, and in the end, the, the results were, you know, they, they can't compete if you put them next to a competition entry now. So it's not absolute, but we have to very, very strongly recognize this this connection clearly, which is interesting. That means that you can always expect if you find new uh, tools <clears throat> and new computational tools, etc., and other tools of working, uh, that you that you would be probably contribute something to the development of the field in terms of new stimulations, new formal effects, and maybe eventually a new subsidiary style, not a new epochal style, sorry. <laughs> My question is about algorithm yeah. and the form generated through computer and uh, the impact of the form in generating the language and the philosophy that we are not talking about and which I think is quite contrary to what is normal or usual as we understand about architecture developing through social behavior, culture, beliefs, and so on and so forth. But now we are into generating all that through machine and algorithm <coughs> and the forms. So how would you define that in terms of the philosophy and language that you have kind of very cleverly protected tonight to us, how is it kind of balancing out? Thank you. Well, I mean, the proliferation of expressive potential, spatial, organizational potentials through algorithms. I mean, when you first start out, you just play with it and you proliferate and you're just mesmerized by the new repertoires and possibilities. And <clears throat> But eventually, these are problem-solving repertoires. The problems also evolved, by the way, that's also important to recognize, because the rest of society is also using algorithms that changes the social dynamics. But ultimately, you have to think that through, right? And, and that's not going to be, the algorithm is not going to do that for you. Uh, how to select, how to find and steer the algorithm to the solution space to find solutions for the particular social configuration and social dynamic you might want to install in a space for multiple audiences, where also an event might have different stages and phases, where it comes together, converges into big altogetherness, breaks up into smaller, small groups, into one-to-ones, fluid and more stable, set for a while. How do you orchestrate this in a conference setting or something? And so you need to develop um, you know, this alertness is really thinking through. I, you can't easily mechanize that. And that obviously, but what you bring to this description of the brief and uh, the, the, the discussion which comes with the client, what kind of scenario and situations they want to create, how you bring the apparatus of architecture to frame that, to en engender this, you know, where you can overview things, where you see things on another level and can now go to it. All of that scenario and we, we that these repertoires they come they, they come come through this expanded repertoire of the let's say parametrism and you can use algorithms to search this. And this stage where I'm working on at the moment where I'm in particular subsets developing agent-based simulations of occupancy processes and interaction processes, focusing on for instance, encounters and the conversion of encounters and communication and having models where you have different parts of an overall population, for instance, different team affiliations on a corporate campus, different disciplinary affiliations, insiders, outsiders, different situations of engagement, and, and then run thousands of element agents and try to find, you know, who would likely, in what kind of constellation, settle for, for an information exchange. The whole reason of bringing thousands of people to this campus is to, you know, for, the in, for having information exchange, collaboration, ag uh, agendas developed, um, intervisibility, inter-awareness, but for the sake of productivity. And so, so, so 
this is a very specific element. So where we can actually bring in social functionality simulations and run and basically expose our spaces in the simulation to occupancy patterns and measuring which one has delivers more encounters of a certain type, more conversions of encounters into communications of a certain type. Basically, the, the, the researcher sits right behind you with a PhD on this uh, under my, my uh, supervision. So, so, so that indicates you the, 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 the deep interest in ultimately the social performance of spaces. And, and, but for order, to, if you have only very restrictive repertoire, you, everything you try to do with straight walls and right angles and, and, and uh, closed rooms with doors between rooms, I mean, if you have that formal a priori <clears throat> so rigidly defined, then you can also only think in terms of a schedule of accommodation where, where, where simple labels are pasted into these rooms. That's the architecture of modernism. That's how far you get. But you don't get very far when it comes to designing Google campus, right? Which has a whole cluster of startup companies embedded in there, et cetera, et cetera. So we need these repertoire expansion of <clears throat> parametrism, tectonism, uh, for as problem solving repertoires, but we also need, of course, need to understand and learn how to bring that to bear to actually solve these problems. And, 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 and so that's why we do these kind of simulations. That's the, that you see where, where my, the ultimate kind of responsibility lies and the up, ultimate upgrading of this uh, project lies. And I didn't, was part of this lecture, but I've been talking about agent based parametric semiology. Uh, which is this kind of um, process of operationalizing these kind of architectures, which you can look at and understand, wow, yeah, I can see many things here, it's interesting, and this, it's so rich and diverse, and I'm so curious what all these spaces be. I bet they mean different things I can learn about. That's an intuitive grasp, and we have ability to kind of gauge this, but then to operationalize it more precisely, thinking through for a particular brief and a particular organization with particular agendas. They don't need enough space. That's not the point. They want to engender something, a social process, a combustion, a catalyzing of energies and interactions. That's what we're trying to get our hand on and speculate about uh, ultimately. So tectonism feeds into that project. And that's this kind of tectonism upgraded according to uh, my kind of theoretical projection, not tectonism as it exists now. We have to be quite clear about this. <laughs> okay. Um, if there's not a pressing question, I, I would make the suggestion since there's drinks in the back and the book launch, and maybe things can be a bit more conversational and less formal, that we could leave it here and allow everybody to... You want another question? That's a drink question. No, he was about to applaud. Oh, <laughs> applaud. <laughs>